Hailing from Sunderland in the north of England, field music have combined cult recognition with an independent spirit. We joined them to talk about their writing and recording process as they developed and worked on a song in their own studio. I'm David Brewis. And I'm Peter Brewis. And we've been making records as field music since... 2004? Yeah, 2004. Um, we've done all of that at our own studios over that time. This is our third iteration of the studio. Today, we've got a song to record for a project we're working on, working on at the moment. Um, it's mostly my song. It is your song. So, oh, so that's another thing we should, uh, we should remember here. Whoever's song it is, is in, they are they're in, charge. in charge. So they make the, that's, that's, that's the deal. That's it's the like, only way to make this band work. Otherwise... What? <laughs> so, so, for, so today, I am the lackey. You know, Do I'm you in charge. It's not what it's always like in the band. Most of the time, <laughs> I'm in charge. It's my band. Um, but for today, for the purposes of this experiment... Dave's in charge for a change. So we'll, try, <laughs> so we'll try, we'll try, you know, a live take first where I play the drums okay. inexpertly, but maybe with the feel that I think the song should be. And then, and we'll then switch I will, I'll, I'll have to learn how you, you play the drums. You try and play and do the, <laughs> my feel, but better. <laughs> and I'll play a different instrument. Oh, the pressure, the pressure. <laughs> For this particular project we're, we're, we're working on at the moment, um, we've been asked to do a commission for a, a festival in Durham, Durham Brass Festival. Um, and we were asked, you know, would you like to play in this amazing building called Red Hills, which was the, the, the home of the Durham Miners Association, still is actually, um, was known as the Pitman's Parliament. And would you like to play with a brass band? So... We kind of like dived into finding out about how the Durham Miners Association came about and why it's such an important part of the fabric of where, you know, where we are and dived into how we could turn what we do musically into something which a tenor horn and a euphonium and an E-flat bass and all of these other instruments we've never worked with might oh, might use. Tell the people they be marked if they brought the strike again. I think when we start a new song and we're thinking about recording it, we'll most often think about a way that me and Dave can like actually perform something together. We tend to try and capture a, a performance um, almost as soon as we can, because I'm not a big fan. I don't think either of us, uh, either of us are, are big fans of capturing multiple takes to get it perfect. We're not really interested in perfection. We're interested in getting something that sounds and feels right. Um, or feels kind of fun, fun, exciting. yeah, yeah. Feels like, and once it starts getting boring, then we'll either switch around, or we'll stop, or we'll say, "Look, that take, you know, they'll get the idea, you know." <laughs> Things could get deleted, but I think we try and start off with the idea of 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 a performance, capturing some of the capturing some of that energy of playing in a room. Our idiosyncrasies kind of like come out, but then the more that you iron out those idi idiosyncrasies, the more boring the record becomes. I think. <laughs> but often, what we'll do is we'll change, we'll change around, and sometimes it just gives a different feel, gives a different sound. You know, me and Dave aren't too dissimilar as drummers. We both own the same drum kit. Um, <laughs> in fact, maybe we're not even drummers. I don't know, but um, you know, we we own the same drum kit, so we don't. It doesn't sound that different, but some, we, the feels kind of different quite often just have the mic sort of around ready to go um ready ready to record whenever we, we come in i mean i suppose what we, we do we quite often record rehearsals as well with the band yeah we, we set up with this space thinking that we wanted there 
not to be too much of a difference between us getting to rehearse and and recording. <laughs> That's our sound. <laughs> our micing setup for the drums has grown in a really strange way, and we there is a setup that we have used most often, and that's what we've got set up today, where we do not have matched overheads. That developed because we did not have matched overheads. <laughs> um, we'd heard something about mid side micing, didn't understand it. And did a setup for our second album actually, where we had a a large diaphragm condenser at the front of the kit and a ribbon mic behind the kit. Then we found that by tilting the null of the ribbon, we could get minimise. M- you know, you could get the balance between the hi hat and the snare yeah, drum yeah. and the, the floor tom a little bit differently. And we we really got into that sound, and that became that became like our main sound. And we thought that was our sound. Then at some point we did get other microphones. We tried other microphones and discovered that actually the microphones we used were much less important than how we play and how we have the drums set up. <laughs> yeah. So the pillow's just sort of, um... God, that sounds so dead. That's probably all right for this stuff, isn't it? So since then, we've used lots of different things depending on subtle changes that we wanted to make. We, we did a record called Drifters, which was instrumental, and we um, had a, a couple of small diaphragm condensers set up in a O-R-T-F, O-T-R-F, that clever way that they did. Oh, the, the French thing. Yeah, the French thing. Yeah. Um, and that worked nicely. And it still sounded like us, although so maybe like a little bit less boomy. But we do end up going back to this thing of almost sort of Ringo behind your head and Bonham sort of <laughs> in front of your head. And and then we hard pan them. So it's almost like, in my mind, it's almost like it kind of, because the transients are so different on the two microphones, it's almost like you've double tracked the drums. So you've got kind of like a Ringo-ish sort of, you know, like a 64 Ringo sound on that side. Then you've got kind of, you know, 1974 sort of, or well, 75, like Headley Grange sound on on that side. And that's, that to me is the sort of, yeah, that's, 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 that's good. That's our midpoint. Yeah. I feel like in those sections, I'm, I'm hitting the bass drum too hard, and I think I'm doing it like to try and stay in time. And maybe I should We We have stuck with this idea of like, rather than left and right overheads, we've got front and back overheads. And I thought, oh, well, this is nonsense. Why do we do this? Why And why do I like it? And then I saw um, a little clip, I think, of George Massenberg saying, well, you, you, the axis of your drums is where your bass drum and your snare drum are. And actually, if you take that as the middle, having a front and a back, which is a bit like... Um, the Glyn Johns set up. So even though we've arrived at that by accident, because we're 
foolish and don't know what they're <laughs> doing. Um, I think we've ended up coming up with something which seems to work. So we were making a decision on which take we're going to use. And we've, we've, you've made a decision because your song, so you get to choose. I've yeah. got nothing to say on this. I mean, I don't think there's like loads in it in terms of the drums, but I feel like the momentum on the take where you play drums is better. It just whips along and the, it sounds good. The overhead sounds good. I'm on the drums and you'll play bass. Yes, because for this... through um, Marshall. Um, we've got a very big Marshall valve amp. For some reason, the very big old Marshall valve amps for bass are, aren't that expensive at the moment because everyone wants amps they can carry. Um, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. Um, so we, we came across this uh, valve amp and I've been going through a period I say period, we've been going through the last four or five years of being like slightly obsessed by the bass playing of Andy Fraser, a free, and also Willie Weeks playing on the Donny Hathaway live album from 1972. And the bass sounds on those records are not particularly hi-fi. There's not loads of treble, there's not like the kind of definition that you associate with really technically proficient bass playing. The bass playing on those records is absolutely incredible and the sound is incredible, but it's really like, it's focused on a, like the low mm. mids, like a really like saturated low mid sound. bass speakers because again I'm, I'm not bothered about the the high trebly sounds from a bass we don't need them or I think one of the things you found is like variation you can get in bass sounds from how you play the bass yeah it's go like it's quite a lot really really wide wide range and you know depending on whether you pl we're playing with the plectrum or playing with fingers how you mute it how far up the neck you might play it. You know, if you, you can get it very, very clicky if you're right yeah. by the bridge or, or kind of woodier if you, you're going up uh, towards the neck. And there's um, also a tone control. Is there? Yeah. I've never tried that. I, I, I have, I have. It was Maybe good. today's the day. <laughs> so what bass are you going to use today? Are you going to try... I don't know. I, I, I still haven't decided. Okay. So... Okay. I've got an Epiphone Rivoli bass, um, which I'll be honest, mostly sounds terrible, but it might be the right thing for this, where I don't need that kind of like strong low. The bass sound is weird, but I think it's the right thing for this song. I think the DI sounds like quite good. It's got like no sustain on it. It just like plonks, but I think it's, we wouldn't usually do that kind of thing, but I think it's the right thing for this okay. track. Yeah. I just think the telly sounds better for... I think double track guitars sound amazing. They do. I had to trick someone into double track on a guitar the other day. <laughs> Our general guitar, recording guitar setup, hasn't changed that much. I, I, again, we've, we've tried loads of different things, um, but our sort of go-to, as they call it, or as we call it, um, is still a, a ribbon shiny box um, in front of a Fender um, Deluxe Reverb turned up really loud, and it's got that right level of compression and the ribbon as well like kind of gives it 
a space. Um, yeah, we, we tend not to have the microphone too close. right up close with, with the shiny box, and I don't know whether that's just because we're scared of damaging it, but also just having it that like six inches to a foot away means you're getting a, the direct sound, but you also get just the sound yeah. of the room. And it, you know, we've done other things as well, but that always feels like that's the easiest way of getting our our kind of guitar yeah. That's sound. all. That's ge generally the starting point. But then again, you know, we, we I've done a lot of DI'd guitars recently as well. You know, using a um, it's a little Strymon the Strymon deco sort of pedal. Yeah, deco pedal, which is just you know, just it's like it's meant to be like a tape machine, and it's fine. It's got the right sort of saturation just to sort of plug in and and um we've recorded a little bit with the fox ac10 AC um yeah which has got that it's got the chime you know um we we use a a marshall vintage modern for live because the um the deluxe refurb's too loud much much yeah, too, it's loud. too loud 22 um, watts, come on. It's so, so loud. We've had a lot Every of sound engineer, live sound engineer just says, can you please turn that down? Okay, so it'll be something like... Just Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Jank, jank, jank. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to talk about uh, favourite guitars then, Dave? Do you want to talk about your, your favourite guitars? I think we should both talk about our favourite guitars because we have quite different tastes in guitars. Well, my two, my two favourite guitars at the moment are my Gordon Smith SG with um, two P90s in and my Japanese Aerodyne Strat, which is a, a, a Gibson scale Strat, because I've got lazy, and <laughs> uh, I find the, um, after, uh, after using the, um, the Gordon Smith, Smith SG so much, um, I went back to my, my um, you know, normal scale length Strat, you know, the 25 and a half inch, and I found it really hard to um, A, know where I was, and B, to sort of bend the, you know, the, the strings any more than sort of, you know, a semitone. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I found, actually a friend b bought me this um, uh, this Aerodyne. You've got good friends. I've got a good, so actually both of those guitars aren't really mine. Um, Aerodyne strap was bought for me and the Gordon Smith is on, I hope, permanent loan. No, no. Shall I put on his little coat? <laughs> I mean, it sounds quite good, actually. And yeah. I don't think anyone's going to listen to it and think they've ripped off no stairway. stairway. <laughs> no stairway. <laughs> what about you? Um. So for a long time, I used almost exclusively a kind of mutant. Gibson SG special and we've never found anything like it because we think it's a reject. I realised that because it's so irreplaceable that I maybe shouldn't rely on it exclusively, especially for touring. And also, I mean, I was listening to a lot of prints and a lot of other things with a much more like <clears throat> single coil kind of sound and I... I found a vintage V6, it's a vintage brand, not, not old and expensive. Um, it's their Strat style guitar in a guitar stroke aquatics shop <laughs> around the corner from my house. <laughs> and it was £125 and I thought, that maybe that's the one for me. <laughs> and I bought it and I thought, wow, this, this is a really good quality guitar for £125 from an aquatic shop. Yeah, aquatic, it sounds aquatic. 
Sounds like you bought it from like an aquatic shop. I know this one. I, I bought no. this from a real music shop. <laughs> don't, don't say that. It is a real music shop and a real aquatic shop. Well, I might listen to you do this guitar solo. <laughs> Again, we've done we've done lots of different things for vocals over the years, and have gradually become slightly less paranoid about being able to get something done. We do have an old Neumann U87 and as far as this will definitely record a good sounding vocal. That's a nice place to start from. Before we got that we, we've got a modified Octava MK319 and it's not in the best shape, but that still gives a good sound. And then we've got a bunch of good dynamics that we use for vocals. Yeah, like I mean, I tend to quite often use, like leave the speakers on and record using like an either an, an F SM7 um, or the um, Sennheiser 441. 441. Just so I can kind of, instead of just being stuck with headphones on all the time, because sometimes that gets really boring. Um, and tiring. I felt sorry for Davy, though I kept it to myself. He did what many a man would do when it led him to his death. Yeah, and, I, and I've done stuff with the uh, RE20, and at the yeah. moment, what I've been mostly using for all of my demos is a uh, Bear Dynamic M69, which is like the same shape as an M88, but I believe not as you. I believe you. It's anyway. It's it, it's good. It's, it's it's an easy like little dynamic, but it, it gets a good sound. Yeah, and we've, and we've still got the Rode NT1, which you know I used quite a lot. You know when we were in lockdown for the last album, I've recorded loads of vocals just in the house, just using the, the Rode NT1, and it's, it still sounds. It's still probably like one of the best value microphones yeah. you can possibly get. We don't use it, I don't use it that often, but... And I think it's quite an early NT1. I don't know whether there's any diff... I've heard people say there's like a difference between the, the, the old ones and, and the new ones. It's like, I don't know, I haven't used one of the new ones, so... But it still works. And the fact that they've got like next to no self-noise is quite useful as well. For, I think yeah. for a few times we've used it as room mics on the drums, like a, a pair of those. Yeah. You can or strings as well. We've used yeah, great, strings. great, great for the string. Um, I'm trying to think. If there's any anything else that we've. I use that a, the the a, a, what's the AKG pencil mic called? I use that quite a few times for vocals as well. I don't know why. Which one? Um, the small, the really small one, or the. Yeah, the eighties one, the AKG. Four five one. Four 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 five one. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Did you? Yeah, for for like. Smaller sounds, you know, so something like where you, where you don't really. Yeah, if you've got a certain EQ in mind, do it with. And I think I did it just because I. That's what you. It have. was there, and then I thought, oh, obviously they didn't use them on top of the pops, but they're all, they're always on top of the pops. <laughs> People stand there singing into the, you know, these. You AKG can get you can mics. get a capsule actually for them to to, to do vocals. All oh, right, okay, well, I mean, we haven't, but it we, doesn't yeah, matter. We won't, yeah. And then. I mean, I've ended up going like way back into the history of the development of the mining industry. So I've ended up writing loads of songs about mining in the 19th century. What happened quite often 
um, if the mine workers said they were going to go on strike, the mine owners, you know, were not inclined to give in to their unreasonable demands like ventilation in the shafts or not employing eight-year-olds. So what they would do instead is quite often go to other um, mining areas around the country, find some workers in need of work and say, we've got a lot of work up in Durham at the moment. Not say, we're bringing you up here to break a strike. So they'd bring these workers up to Durham um, on Northumberland. The, the workers from wherever it was, in the case of this song, it's from Wales, couldn't afford to get back home. So they would, ha they would have to break the strike, would be despised by the locals. Um, and there's this one particular story told in this book um, of a guy they called Blind Davy because his eyesight was terrible. In order to avoid all of the other local miners who, you know, would bully him in every which way you can imagine, he, he would go to the pit early or go to the pit late in order to avoid everyone else. Um, and on one, you know, dark evening, heading down towards the pit, not being able to see very well, he fell down the pit shaft and died. That's all for now. If you like what you saw, please be sure to like and share it, and subscribe and click the bell icon so you know when we upload new content to our YouTube. Also find us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Thanks for watching.